Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this enlightening opportunity to acquire knowledge. It is my pleasure to address you all today from the captivating continent of Africa, specifically Kenya. In this instructional session, we shall delve into the intricacies of the initial assessment protocol for individuals newly diagnosed with tuberculosis. It is imperative to note that our previous discussion revolved around the strategies involved in administering appropriate treatment to adults afflicted with drug-susceptible tuberculosis. Adult patients newly diagnosed with TB should receive the following care once they are received at the clinic. Detailed clinical evaluation, including history of previous treatment and comorbid condition. Patient education, counseling, including adherence counseling, substance abuse counseling, mental health assessment. Nutritional assessment, diagnosis and management. Where accessible, a baseline chest x-ray should be done for persons with pulmonary tuberculosis. Guys, we should line list all contacts invited and traced and manage accordingly. Initiation of treatment and follow-up during treatment should be done. My people, my friends, Let's look at the role of chest X-ray in tuberculosis screening and diagnosis. It's used as a screening tool for tuberculosis in those at risk or during targeted outreaches to screen those eligible for testing. As an aid in diagnosis of active pulmonary TB and some extrapulmonary TB, for example, in pleural, pericardial, nodal, spine, and others. X-ray also is used to differentiate latent TB versus active TB based on the radiographic findings. Yes, X-ray is used to characterize radiographic abnormalities so as to exclude other differential from appropriate referral and management. It's also useful in the follow-up treatment response based on clinical status especially for patients who are not improving in the first month of treatment or patients who get worse after initial improvement clinically. X-ray is also used in detection of complications of active TB disease and post-TB sequelae. X-ray is also used as baseline chest X-ray examination to support comparative evaluation during the treatment follow-up of patients. There are some things that I need us to note. Where accessible, pulmonary TB patients should have chest X-ray at the beginning of treatment and at the end of treatment in six months. All patients with chest X-ray features suggestive of TB at baseline should have sputum specimens submitted for microbiological examination. Sure. It is a major omission to diagnose pulmonary TB on the basis of a chest X-ray only. Sure. I want us to look at radiographic views and utility. The ones that are actually recommended. There is posterior anterior, which is PA view. It is a standard view of all adults. There is AP, anterior posterior. It's used for patients unable to stand, including the very sick, elderly, and children. Lateral view is used as an aid to AP and PA view to evaluate the mediastinum. Hila regions, the posterior lung and spine. Lodotic view is used to evaluate subtle changes in the lung to provide better visualization. Apical view. It is used to evaluate subtle changes in the apical segments of the upper lobes to provide better visualization. 
Let's look at lateral decubitus. It's taken to rule out small pleural fluid in the presence of blunting of the costophrenic ankles. What about image reporting? Chest X-ray should be viewed by a clinician for definitive management and referral as appropriate. Abnormal chest X-ray should be reported by a radiologist for confirmation of the diagnosis. Let's look at radiological findings in pulmonary tuberculosis. TB disease exhibits a varied range of radiographic patterns in the lungs, depending on the patient immunological status. Exposure, whether recent or past, and duration of infection. It can be primary or post-primary, typical or atypical. <laughs> Let's look at primary TB. You will find lymphadenopathy. Consolidation, pleural effusion, and miliary nodules. What about post primary TB? You will find consolidation or focal infiltration, mainly involving the apical or posterior segments of the upper lobes and posterior segments of the lower lobes, cavitations, nodules, or even fibrosis. In HIV-infected persons with intact immunity, the radiographic picture is often typical. Yes? In advanced HIV with severe immunosuppression, the radiologic picture is often atypical with lower or mid-zone shadows and the presence of HeLa or mediastinal lymph node enlargement or pleural effusion being relatively common. Yes? Wow, people, let's look at diagnosis of extrapulmonary tuberculosis. TB can affect all body tissues except the hair, nails, and the teeth enamel. The diagnosis of extrapulmonary TB largely depends on the health workers to conduct appropriate investigation to rule out other differential diagnoses. Common ones will include pleural TB with pleural effusion, tuberculous peritonitis and ascites, TB meningitis, TB pericarditis, TB adenitis, TB encephalitis, or tuberculoma. TB of the skin, TB of the bones, and even joints. Let's know the following. When a patient presents with symptoms of TB and the healthcare worker is not able to make diagnosis or when there are signs of severe disease, a rapid referral to the next appropriate level is highly recommended. Don't stay with the patient or send the patient back home. Yes, my people. Treatment of TB benefits both the individual patient and the community as a whole. Any health provider undertaking to treat a patient for tuberculosis is assuming an important public health function. That includes not only prescribing an appropriate treatment regimen, but also ensuring adherence to the regimen until treatment is completed. Yes, guys, we have to look at the goals of TB treatment. Let's look at the overall goals of TB therapy. The main goal is actually to cure patients and therefore prevent suffering. Prevent transmission of the infection. And another one is to prevent death. Also, we are trying to prevent long-term complications or sequel of TB. We're also trying to prevent relapse of the disease and also prevent the development of drug resistance tuberculosis. Is that so, my people? I want us to look at the principles of TB treatment. One of it is never ever use a single drug. This includes the likelihood of selection of natural occurring resistance mutants to mycobacterium tuberculosis. 
another one is always use drugs in combination using fixed dose combination to avoid selection of natural occurring resistant mutants to the mycobacterium tuberculosis drug dosage is based on weight to achieve therapeutic drug level in the body and prevent medication side effects also drug intake should be directly observed for all patients to ensure adherence prevent emergence of drug resistance assess for medication side effects and to follow clinical response closely another one is also to ensure the entire treatment is taken as recommended by the caregiver health caregiver yes let's look at these first line anti tb drugs anti tb drugs should have one of the following properties yes the first one it should be bactericidal and another one should be sterilization bactericidal has ability to kill the rapidly dividing metabolic active bacilli found in the walls of cavities and in the sputum of patients with microscopy smear positive pulmonary tuberculosis drugs with high early bactericidal activity such as isoniazid will make the patient non infectious as early as possible so isoniazid is a very important drug in the treatment of tuberculosis for sterilization sterilization has ability to kill persisting dormant or intermittently active bacilli responsible for relapses drugs with rapid sterilization ability such as rifampicin and pyrazamide will lead to shortening of treatment there are four drugs used in the first line treatment of tuberculosis these drugs are called rifampicin isoniazid pyrazamide and then ethambutol in short i call it ripe <laughs> these drugs are given in two phases of treatment the first phase is intensive phase that lasts for two months and usually consists of four drugs its aim is to achieve a rapid killing of actively dividing bacteria resulting in the reduction of bacillary load negativization of sputum within two weeks and eradication of clinical symptoms continuation phase lasts for four months to 10 months usually consists of two drugs its aim is to kill any remaining or dormant bacilli and preventing subsequent relapse yeah are we together guys we are going to look at grading of anti tb drugs that is from the high to the lowest activity so for prevention of resistance isoniazid tops then rifampicin followed by ethambutol then pyrazinamide for early bactericidal activity we still have isoniazid topping then etambutol then rifampicin and then pyrazinamide for sterilizing activity rifampicin tops the list followed by pyrazinamide then isoniazid and then lastly etambutol the four first line tb drugs have specific individual properties that are usually useful in treating the different tb bacilli populations present in any patient properties of individual tb drugs let's look at isoniazid let's look at its action isoniazid has bactericidal action with highest potency has highest early bactericidal activity and kills over 90 percent bacilli in the first few days of treatment yes guys isoniazid targets rapid and intermediate growing bacilli survives in alkaline and acid media it works in intracellular and extracellular compartment what about rifampicin rifampicin has bactericidal action with high potency most effective sterilizing agent targets all populations including dormant bacilli it survives well in an alkaline and acid media 
works best in intracellular and extracellular compartments. What about pyrazinamide? Pyrazinamide is a bactericidal with a low potency, highly potent sterilizing agent and highly effective during the first two months of treatment. It targets slowly multiplying bacilli, survives well in an acid media, works best for intracellular bacilli only. These are the microphages. Yes? What about etambutol? Etambutol is bacteriostatic, has low potency, minimizes the emergence of possible initial resistance to the isoniazid. It targets all bacterial populations, survives in alkaline and acid media, works in intracellular and extracellular compartments. TB treatment involves the use of multiple drugs taken in combination. <laughs> These are often combined into fixed dose combination tablets, which contains two or more medicine within the same tablet. Yeah, are you getting it, my people? Let's look at the advantages of using fixed dose combination. Number one, there is reduced risk of resistance developing to the drugs in the event of missed doses. Number two, reduction of pill burden. Three, fewer medication errors. Then also fewer prescription errors. Easier for treatment supporter to monitor treatment through dots. <laughs> Disadvantages of using fixed dose combination. One, reduced bioavailability of some drugs. And then also flexibility in obtaining an optimal dose of some agents. Also, we'll have difficulty in ascertaining cause of adverse drug effects when using fixed dose combination. Yeah. Let's look at DOT, direct observation therapy. It helps patients to improve adherence to treatment and treatment completion, thus achieving cure and preventing the development of drug resistance. Yes, guys. The first line treatment for adults is two months of average ZD, then four months of average for all forms of TB except in TB meningitis and osteocritulata TB. That takes two months of average ZD and then 10 months of average. Let's look at weight based dosage for first line fixed dose combination. That is the average ZD. Someone of 30 to 39 kgs will take two tablets. 40 to 54 will take three tablets. Over 55 will take four tablets. That is 55 to 69, four tablets. And then over 70 kgs will take five tablets. Things to also note are, monthly monitoring of weight should be done and recorded in the patient TB record card and doses adjusted accordingly. No trial of therapy should be done to minimize the emergence of drug resistance, guys. For children or adolescents above 30 kgs, do not give 60-60, but treat as adults. That is RH. Don't give 60-60. All patients taking anti-TB should also receive daily pyridoxine to reduce risks of developing peripheral neuropathy. However, Lack of pyridoxine should not stop TB therapy. Guys, thank you for listening. That is the end of our discussion today. And thank you so much for staying with me. Remember to always like and subscribe to the channel. at Nandi Empress. Thank you guys. And welcome again for another session.